Welcome to the first grand rounds of 2017. Today we are Dr. Ferreira from the Department of Hematology and Oncology to discuss new approaches to graft versus host disease. Dr. Ferreira is a professor in the Department of Medicine, Pediatrics, and Hematology and Medical Oncology. He obtained his medical degree from Georgetown Medical School, after which he completed his pediatric residency and fellowship at Boston Children's and the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. After 19 years, he relocated to the University of Michigan to direct the combined adult and pediatric BMT programs. He was recruited to the Icon School of Medicine in 2014 to become the Ward Coleman Professor of Cancer Medicine and to direct the, cancer, the Center for Translational Research in Hematologic Malignancies. Dr. Flores' clinical and research career has focused on the immunology of bone marrow transplantation, particularly its major complication of graft versus host disease. Using novel proteomic techniques, his team has identified and validated unexpected biomarkers for skin, gut, and steroid resistant graft versus host. He has created exceptionally large and informative biorepositories and in line with to melt these biomarkers into the first algorithm that predicts response to treatment to help guide graft versus host therapy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ferrara. Well, uh, thank you very much, and thank you for coming on a, on a busy Tuesday morning. You know, I love those introductions. It always sounds like you've been talking to my mother, as if my mother had gone to medical school and would understand this. So um, let's, uh, let's dive right in. So uh, for those of you who don't live in this space, uh, graft-versus-host disease comes in two forms, acute and chronic. Uh, very few people, including myself, are smart enough to understand chronic graft-versus-host disease, so I don't study it. Um, and, uh, and most of the problems of chronic graft-versus-host disease that occur after day 100 following transplantation, um, actually the, the table is set during acute graft-versus-host disease, which is the most important risk factor for chronic. So we're going to focus today on acute GVHD, and in terms of clinical uh, transplantation and clinical research, uh, I think it will become clear as to why we uh, try to do that. But if you have questions about chronic, um, I'd be happy to talk to folks after the, um, after the grand rounds. So acute GVHD, major complication. Its primary treatment, which is high-dose systemic steroids, hasn't changed in 40 years. Since this therapy, we've gone to the moon, we have had major wars, uh, it, the rest of medicine has changed significantly, but we're in transplantation basically still in the Stone Age. Um, we, we, none of the, we've learned more about cancer and more about immunology in the last decade than in all of human existence beforehand. And in transplantation, we're still using high-dose steroids. So this is a problem. Um, part of that problem is the fact that the, the current clinical grading systems uh, can correlate the maximal GVHD, the maximal severity, with non-relapse mortality. And graft-versus-host disease or the complications from its treatment are the major cause of non-relapse mortality after transplant. But the maximal severity reflects the response to treatment, and so it can only be determined retrospectively. And there are many studies that show that the clinical severity at diagnosis does not correlate with non-relapse mortality and hence doesn't guide treatment. So that's part of the mess that we're currently in uh, and why nothing other than uh, high-dose steroids seems to have worked because we actually don't know what we're treating. We're over-treating some patients, we're uh, uh, under-treating others, and uh, some patients probably shouldn't be treated at all. This is just uh, an example to show you. Uh, this is now uh, almost 20 years old, but when we used to do bone marrow transplantation for a disease like chronic myelogenous leukemia, and we would have a fairly stable um, primary disease entity upon which to look at the survival of a, a specific kind of transplant, what you can see is that as the grades of GVHD increase, the mortality also increases, as does its rapidity. Uh, for those of you who are paying attention, you'll see that grade one uh, gives you actually slightly better mortality than grade zero, and in larger series, this has been shown to be the case. 
The reason is that we use allogeneic transplantation to cure very high-risk hematologic malignancies like leukemia and lymphoma. The, the positive part of that is a graft versus leukemia effect. So if you, if you have leukemia and relapse, you have about a trillion malignant cells uh, in circulation. Even if the re chemo radiotherapy that we use as conditioning gives you a 99.99% kill, you're still left with hundreds of millions of leukemic cells. The graft versus leukemia effect is what eliminates those uh, residual, that minimal residual disease, if you will. It's not so minimal, but it's residual disease. Now, the dark side of that force is graft versus host disease because the same histocompatibility antigens that the donor T cells are recognizing on the leukemia are also on various tissues of the body, particularly antigen presenting cells that are also of the hematopoietic system. So you wind up with a, uh, an, an amplified response uh, that gives you tissue damage primarily in the skin, the liver, and the gut. Now, it's the GI tract that, uh, and the refractoriness of the GI tract to uh, therapy that kills our patients. So we're going to spend a lot of time uh, on uh, the GI tract as we go forward. This is just to show you an example. It's a data set um, where we had a, a, the clinical trials network. Um, which is supported by the NIH, conducts clinical trials in bone marrow transplantation um, nationally. And we had two trials where we treated patients um, with acute graft versus host disease with steroids plus something else. There were several something else's. I'm not going to go into that. But this is just to show you that, and by the way, both of those trials failed. Uh, they, they were wonderful new agents, but they failed. And part of the reason that they failed is that we don't know what the risk is at the onset of treatment. And so here are 300 patients from, that, from two of those trials um, where we had blood samples that we were going to look at for biomarkers. And what you can see here is that the onset grade of 1, 2, or 3, or 4, grade 4 at onset is very rare, so it's, it's only about 2 to 3 percent of the patients. So it usually gets combined with grade 3. And what you can see is that there's really no separation, even in 300 patients, of the uh, survival after uh, the onset of GVHD. We took those 300 patients because I had um, been very interested in trying to understand both the biology of GVHD but to, but to develop some early prognosticators. We had worked for about uh, 10 years on first a proteomics approach and now a more targeted approach to identify blood biomarkers. We looked at blood biomarkers, soluble biomarkers, because as, as some of you know, after a conditioning regimen, for the first 10 days after transplant, the, the patient is neutropenic and has no cells whatsoever. Um, the average onset of graft versus host disease is about day 23 or day 24, and at that point, patients are still lymphopenic. So even if you had a very sensitive uh, fax assay to look at the phenotype of lymphocytes. The, the, they are so few in the circulation that it would be very difficult to decide which cells to look at. However, we knew from the animal models that we were using that the graft versus host reaction precedes by weeks the, uh, the systemic uh, manifestations of GVHD because the lymphocytes that are causing the disease are actually in the tissues uh, beginning to activate and proliferate and attack. So we wondered whether we could uh, look at some of the soluble either receptors or cytokines that are shed by these cells and whether they would be circulating and they could be the biomarkers. In the animal studies, that worked out very clearly, and then we started to have some success in the clinic, and we, we identified several of them. I'm going to tell you now about uh, first three and then two and then one of the biomarkers that have been particularly successful, we found that uh, using three biomarkers, we could actually develop an algorithm of those same 300 patients that I just showed you, that way you, if you look in their peripheral blood and you measure these biomarkers, you could determine risk factors for these patients, and we called it an Ann Arbor scoring system because all of this work had been done in Ann Arbor. 
And what you can see here are the same 300 patients that you just saw here, now reclassified not by their clinical grade, but by their biomarker grade, and you can s clearly separate them into three separate risk groups. These biomarkers are actually looking at early disease, um, a graft versus host disease in the tissues, and actually not measuring the strength of the graft versus leukemia reaction. The, the relapse rate in all three of these groups is the same, and so when you look at the overall survival, you again get um, a completely separate risk factors for these three groups, these Ann Arbor groups. As you would expect, we used, in, in defining that algorithm, we actually used non-relapse mortality as the endpoint to define the algorithm. Um, and we used that endpoint because it's objective. If a patient, die, even here at Mount Sinai, if we know the difference between a dead patient and an alive patient. Uh, and that's true in almost every bone marrow transplant, almost every bone marrow transplant center in the country. So that is objective. Whether you've responded to a treatment or not is not so objective and doesn't get into the databases um, quite as clearly. But uh, as you would hope, in fact, these Ann Arbor groups would also uh, determine or, or predict whether a patient would respond completely to high-dose systemic steroids. So if you're at low risk, you've got about a 75% chance of responding, and if you're at high risk, it's only about a 30% chance. What's particularly useful about this is that within each clinical grade at onset, at the presentation of disease, the biomarkers still uh, risk stratify the patients. So it's called a Glux, the clinical grading system is Gluxberg or modified Gluxberg. Um, that's a mild skin rash. It's less than 50% of the body surface area. And what you can see here is, so all of, the, of those 300 patients that I just showed you, 51 started, presented with uh, grade one graft versus host disease. Uh, and this is, uh, sorry, Glucksberg one, which is the, the minimum that you can get for systemic treatment. And there's no liver involvement and there's no GI involvement. And even with, the, with so Mrs. Uh, Jones presents to the emergency room with a rash, and you're trying to figure out what, whether she's going to have a disease that develops more uh, severely or not. Now you can look at these biomarkers and see that about a quarter of the patients will have a mild disease and will have uh, uh, no mortality. A small group, uh, uh, actually about uh, slightly over half of the patients are at an intermediate risk. And you, can, and you can see about 20% of the patients are at high risk, even in these patients who have only a rash. If you now have more significant disease, so there's some diarrhea or there's some hyperbilirubinemia, what you can see is that the biomarkers, interestingly, in the same sort of proportion of patients, the biomarkers also risk stratify and give you three distinct groups. And in some ways, most interestingly, even in the patients who present with high, clinically high-grade disease. So this is massive diarrhea, this is uh, a bilirubins of uh, seven or over, uh, as well as a total body erythroderm. You still see that about a quarter of the patients are actually downgraded twice to low-risk disease, uh, and half of the patients are now at intermediate risk. So, so this, we believe, is at first going to be a very important clinical research tool because we can now stratify our patients not only by their clinical presentation but by their biomarker presentation. And in fact, there are two national trials that we are currently conducting that are where they, from all over the country, pay, uh, uh, centers are sending samples to our lab at Mount Sinai. The clinical labs have been very supportive and have actually helped us to become CLIA certified so that we can use these as integral biomarkers in um, national clinical trials. Uh, they, they send it overnight. We do. It, these are ELISA assays. So the, we can take no credit for the, the quality of the, the concentration of the biomarkers. All of that is sort of publicly available. These are relatively straightforward kits that we're using that are commercially available. Uh, we've got a lot of quality control to make sure that we get consistent 
uh, values, but then we, within 24 hours, can send back to the City of Hope in Los Angeles or Seattle or the Mayo Clinic or Penn uh, what the biomarker score is and whether they need to be on a high-risk study or a low-risk study. I would also say that you should take from this slide the fact that in this first iteration of the algorithm, slightly more than 50% of the patients are still at intermediate risk. So we've, the, we've got about a quarter who are at low risk and about 20% who are at high risk, but we've still got that 55% in the middle that we don't really have uh, a, a new categorization for. And I'm, I will come to that in a moment. Okay. So biologically, what do we think is happening? So um, when uh, I, here I, I spoke to you about gut disease, it turns out that about 85 to 90 percent of the patients who die from acute graft versus host disease will have steroid resist, either steroid resistant gut disease or, dis, or gut disease that winds up being steroid sensitive but dependent. So you can't taper the steroids. And those patients, so, uh, so this is part of why this is Stone Age medicine. So these are patients who have the immune systems of less than a newborn baby. They get graft versus host disease, and what do we do? We suppress their immune systems to try to stop that lethal complication. Well, that uh, in some ways is not such a smart maneuver, but it's the only thing that we knew how to do. And in fact, of the patients who die from graft versus host disease, almost half of them die without symptoms of graft versus host disease because they've been controlled, but they die of opportunistic infections because of the high dose steroids. And at the University of Michigan, the only patients who died, who died from opportunistic infections were those being, after transplant, were being treated with steroids for their graft versus host disease. And it's the gut that's intractable. So what's happening in the gut? So this is um, part hypothesis, and, and I will show you some data for this later, but just to orient folks. So this is uh, the small intestine. Here's a villus. Here's a blow-up of the crypt. And over here, we see in yellow an, a host antigen-presenting cell. And these are donor T cells that are uh, uh, being activated and proliferating secreting a number of cytokines, including IL-2. This little blue bit over here is a regulatory T cell, and he's or she has been you know, sort of marginalized, can't control the disease anymore. But once these cells are activated, they have to come into the bloodstream, and then they attack, particularly the crypts of, uh, in the intestine. And the players here have been recently identified, um, and they're quite fascinating. So we know about panacells. Even I knew about panacells as a medical student because those are the ones with the big granules that are really easy to identify on your second year histology exam. And I remember getting that question right. One of the few questions I got right. So here are the panacells. Next to the panacells are intestinal stem cells. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been, fabulous work that's been done over the last uh, five years by uh, initiated by Hans Klevers in Holland, sort of looking at these cells that you can now grow these organoids in culture. You can actually make mini guts um, in vitro now, and it's the intestinal stem cells that are critical. But the panacells cells are big helpers. So if you put a, if you put a panacell cell alone into a dish, you won't get anything. You put a stem cell into a dish and you can get a small organoid. You put one panacell cell and one stem cell together and you get 10 organoids. So there, there's something that's really very critical and it's probably to do with wind signaling and, and other um, pathways that are um, just being elucidated that, may, that are the reason that these cells are adjacent to each other in the crypt. What the uh, a third player here is uh, also has been recently described. Beneath each crypt, there is a small sort of immunologic cluster called a crypto patch. Uh, and there are, and it's, there are some T cells, but they're mostly these innate lymphoid cells. Uh, there are three, at least three types. Um, they don't have rearranged T cell receptors, but they do secrete very important molecules. Uh, and one of them is IL-22. And it turns out that uh, we call it an interleukin. Um, it's made by a white cell, but uh, White cells, no white cells that we know of, have IL-22 receptors. 
the only receptors that, that we see for IL-22 are actually on epithelial cells in the gut, particularly panet cells and other enterocytes. And what, I, what this IL-22 does is that it stimulates uh, the production of many moieties, but an important one is uh, an antimicrobial peptide called REG3-alpha. And REG3-alpha is a heavy molecule. It's about 147 kilodal kilodaltons. It sits in the mucus. And so you can, you can and, so, and it forms part of the physical chemical barrier. So you can think of, uh, you can now think of the intestine, the, the luminal side of the intestine as being like covered with a, a, a form of natural prel that keeps all of those trillion uh, members of the microbiome community in the lumen uh, and away from your sterile systemic bloodstream that's only one cell away, right? I mean, this is, the, uh, throughout the GI tract, it's only one cell. So this is a, a very ingenious uh, mechanism that has developed over time, and REG3-alpha is a key, a, a key element of that. Well, it turns out that REG3-alpha is a very important biomarker of gastrointestinal graft versus host disease. And so are the panet cells. If when we, um, part of the, uh, again, part of the difficulty in GVHD is that the histology, if anything, confuses people because it's nonspecific and it's also non-quantitative. The one thing that is quantitative about GI histology for GVHD is the loss of panet cells. Uh, and we showed uh, a couple of years ago with my uh, colleague John Levine, who's been critical to all of this research and uh, about whom you will hear more in a minute. If you look at the, the panet cell loss per high-powered field in uh, GVHD biopsies, if, you've, if you are now um, more than uh, four panet cells still remaining for high-powered field, your chance of non-relapse mortality again, mostly from GI, GVHD, is much less than if you now have less than four panet cells per high power field. So the panet cells, we believe um, that the panet cells and the intestinal stem cells are a sort of functional unit and that you can't count the intestinal stem cells quite so easily because there aren't any cell surface markers that do that. But the panet cells are easy to count, even medical students can do it like me, uh, not particularly good histologists can, can be very quantitative about this, and uh, that, that will translate across centers. So what we think happens during graft-versus-host disease is now that you have this activated um, a lymphocyte that has on its cell surface uh, alpha-4, beta-7, which is like a zip code to go back to the GI tract, it now attacks, it attaches and attacks, uh, killing uh, innate lymphoid cells and stem cells, and you eventually get uh, translocation of both the REG3 that's in the panet cell and that has been stored in the mucus, as well as some of the luminal contents into the systemic circulation. Uh, and, that's, and that's how you get this, uh, this biomarker being elevated. Another biomarker that, in fact, is the single best biomarker for GVHD is another uh, activated uh, cell surface receptor from these T cells called ST2. And it turns out it's the receptor for interleukin-33, which also, as it so happens, is made primarily by, GI, by the GI tract and epithelium in the GI tract. So I told you uh, and showed you the data that a patient presenting with skin disease, only skin disease, that these biomarkers are going to be elevated in the blood and will predict the onset of GI disease later. So we already knew that there was some predictive quality to these biomarkers. Those, uh, that study was done with patients who presented with the disease. We wanted to see whether we could use these same biomarkers to predict graft-versus-host disease before it occurs. So we know that the average onset of GVHD is about day 25 after transplant. It depends a little bit on the intensity of the conditioning regimen and some other factors. But it's about, it's, it's certainly in the fourth week, day 21 to day 28. We wanted to see whether we could predict GVHD, and particularly bad GVHD, lethal GVHD, early so we might be able to uh, eventually initiate preemptive treatment before the onset of symptoms. So that's this next uh, part. 
The three biomarkers that I've been telling you about, REG3-alpha, ST2, the soluble IL-33 receptor, and the soluble TNF receptor were the three biomarkers that went into the initial algorithm. And that was a study that we published about now in Lancet Hematology about two years ago. Our goal is to predict severe and lethal GVHD prior to symptoms. So we're going to look at an algorithm of biomarkers taken from blood samples seven days after transplant to predict severe GVHD. And we're going to use samples from the Mount Sinai Acute GVHD International Consortium um, with the clever acronym of MAGIC. Um, and MAGIC is why uh, Mount Sinai recruited me here, because, they, uh, because Stephen Burikoff, who is my esteemed mentor and uh, who was uh, who had the temerity to accept me in his laboratory when I was a fellow at um, the Dana-Farber 35 years ago, and I knew nothing about immunology. And he said, well, let's give it a shot. And I don't know anything about graft versus host disease, so we'll learn it together. Um, and he was a wonderful mentor, and he knew about some of the work that we were doing. And he said, well, we'd sort of like to get into that field. And would you think of coming to New York? And I said, oh, I don't know, Stephen. This you know, things are going really well, and um, we're happy here in Ann Arbor. And he said, well, just, just come and visit. Um, I didn't even know where Mount Sinai was. I mean, I had, uh, you know, typical, I was actually, to be honest, I was born in Manhattan, but we, we moved to first to Long Island, and then we moved away, and, you know, we would come back to the city, but I'd never been above 84th Street. You know, we'd go to the Met, you know, we'd stay at the Harvard Club in Midtown, and we'd go to Lincoln Center, we'd go to the Met, um, and, I, and I said, well, I'd love to come, but where are you? And he goes, well, we're just a little higher in, on the Upper East Side. And so I came and was charmed, and here I am. So, uh, but the, the dean uh, was very interested in um, seeing whether we could be, uh, be the point of the spear, particularly in a multi-center, transformative, practice-changing group that would use biomarkers to guide therapy. So we've actually got about 20 centers uh, in this now. There are about 10 in the US. There are 10 in Germany. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, I think, an amazing enterprise, um, mostly because of the work that John Levine does, because he gets all of these clinicians together. Uh, we now uh, monitor 800 allogeneic transplants a year. They put all of their data into a common database by web, and then they send all of the samples to Mount Sinai. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're planning for another center in Germany so that, you don't have, so that the samples don't get stuck at an international border when we do it real time. Uh, but these are, these are the centers that are going to, that are now participating, the American centers are all participating in a clinical trial that we're doing um, for uh, high-risk biomarkers. But for this project, we now want to, to predict GVHD before it occurs. So from this, we have about uh, almost 1,300 patients where we have complete clinical data and laboratory samples. The University of Michigan and the University of Regensburg were the two dominant players here. So we took 900 samples from them and put them into a training set and a test set. We used the training set to, de to develop and define, refine the algorithm. We then did a first validation in a test set from within those two centers. And then we're doing a second, uh, we've done a second validation from all the other nine centers from three different countries that had put both clinical data and samples to the, to the laboratory. We use competing risk regression modeling to predict six-month NRM. Again, even within these centers that are working hard to be consistent, um, uh, steroid resistance is not a, yet a firm endpoint because there are too many variations of how to get there. So we're going to use six-month NRM with relapse as the competing risk. We measured four biomarkers, um, uh, and so the three from the initial algorithm, as well as the soluble IL-2 receptor, which as a single biomarker is very powerful, but fell out of the uh, algorithm um, when we were modeling it for the onset of disease. So we used all four biomarkers. We used, then looked at the, all 13 possible combinations um, to predict six-month NRM. Uh, and with uh, in an advance that was uh, really uh, facilitated by our collaboration with a Mount Sinai uh, 
a biostatistician, we used Monte Carlo cross-validation to look at 75 different training sets to see what the how well the algorithm would work in those sets. And we could see that there was a cluster of equations, of algorithms that used uh, certain weights of, because uh, it's, a, it's a weight times the concentration of the biomarker that, that's uh, in the algorithm. Um, we could see that there was a certain clustering of those. So we then looked at these combinations. All four biomarkers we looked at. We looked at the best combination of three, which was ST2, Reg3, and IL2RA. The best two were ST2 and Reg3. Those are the ones that are really specific for the GI tract. And the best single biomarker was ST2. Turns out that the best algorithm was the combination of ST2 and Reg3. And so that final algorithm just generates a probability for each patient. And then, we've, and then you rank the probabilities, so low risk all the way to high risk. And then you've got to pick a threshold to define the high risk group from the low risk group. And, we pick, uh, and it turns out that several thresholds would give us very distinct groups. We picked the threshold finally that gave us the largest number of high risk patients with a maximum, maintaining the maximum difference of non-relapse mortality between the two groups. So here are the data, the training set on the left, the test set on the right, about 11% and 12% um, for the overall group. The algorithm in the training set now gives us a low risk of 8% versus a high risk of 28%. And that's in 16% of the patients. So this is good. But it's the, it's, if you think about it, it's the best uh, that it could be because this is the training set. This is what the computer keeps on looking at over and over again to refine the algorithm. So the first thing is to know how well does it work in the test set. Works pretty well, actually. We again get a, you know, at least a 20% difference, and now we've got 17% of the patients. We were hoping for about a 15% difference and at least 10% of the patients. If it's fewer than 10% of the patients are high risk, that's really going to be very hard to do clinical trials or, 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 or make an advance for those patients. But, th but this was strong. The ACID test is in the multicenter validation study. Here it was 13% of patients, and we've now got a 16% difference between high risk and low risk in terms of mortality, and now it's 20% of the patients. Again, this does not predict relapse, and so here is the overall survival difference. So we, can, we now have about a fifth of the patients before they have any signs of graft-versus-host disease day seven after transplant that we can say, you're at high risk, you need to have preemptive therapy. So. It, it, although the analogy isn't perfect, we think of this as a kind of PCR for GVHD. You know, we've got PCR for CMV. We can tell when the, when the viral load is increasing, and so we're going to change our antiviral therapy based on a lab test. That's exactly what we're hoping that we can do here. Uh, and this is, a, this is only one snapshot on day seven. The, the next thing we're going to do is to look at the low-risk patients on day 14 and see whether they might also now have evidence of high-risk disease, because we think that this is actually looking at um, subclinical disease. Again, these biomarkers are being released from the GI tissues. We know that there are certain clinical risk factors that put you at higher risk for GVHD. For example, if you are an unrelated donor, uh, if you receive a transplant from an unrelated donor, there are multiple minor histocompatibility antigens that we don't type for, but that are certainly present and that can drive T cells. So the algorithm actually works very well, both in related donors and in unrelated donors. It gives us approximately the same separation of roughly 20% in terms of non relapse mortality. What changes is that only 12% of the uh, recipients of related donor transplants are at high risk versus 21% of the unrelated donors. So we are identifying, as we would hope, we are identifying more of the patients who would be at high risk and we've got an equivalently uh, faithful algorithm. That uh, fidelity of performance uh, is true whether you look at donor type, uh, the age of the patient, older patients have more GVHD than younger patients, the use of antithymocyte globulin as prophylaxis, which is very common in Europe and not so common here, uh, and the intensity of the conditioning regimen. Okay, as you would expect, 
This algorithm also predicts outcomes, so the acute GVHD related mortality is four times higher uh, in this group, and, in, and the steroid refractory GVHD is also higher. I started by telling you about the, our three biomarker algorithm that would predict the Ann Arbor grades. So we now asked whether our two biomarker algorithm, which where the TNF receptor had fallen out because it wasn't needed, it didn't add anything, does our two biomarker algorithm give us the same uh, answers as the three biomarker algorithm when we look at patients at the onset of disease? So in those 1,300 patients, we had slightly over 200 where we also had samples at the onset of disease. Now we, we looked at those samples, we measured the biomarkers, the, the 212, and what we found was that now the two biomarker algorithm can give us the same um, risk stratification uh, in, into these three groups, and in fact, it's even better than the three biomarker algorithm because now we have more patients who are correctly identified as minimal risk or low risk, uh, almost half of the patients and slightly less than 30 in each of the uh, moderate and severe groups. We think that this is the case because between the first study and the second study and this study, the kit for the best biomarker, which is ST2, they changed the capture antibody and it's much more sensitive. So we can now detect the single best biomarker at lower concentrations than we could before, and we, and we believe that's why we're getting a, um, a, a better performance with now with just two biomarkers. So we can predict GVHD before it starts. We can give you a risk stratification when, at the onset. Uh, and, and by the way, this was all of this work, this predictive work was done by a very, um, uh, uh, a uh, tremendous uh, medical student uh, who worked in the lab for a year. And the only problem, he wanted to be a pediatric oncologist, and he was doing this fabulous work, and then about three quarters of the way through, he said, Dr. Farrar, I just have to tell you, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon now. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, bless you, orthopedics never had it so good, you know, and he wants to come here. So if there are any orthopedists in the, you know, Matt Hartwell, he's absolutely fantastic, and JCI Insight, uh, it's now in press. We can also use this algorithm after we have treated patients for a week. So if you've, if you've got, uh, if you're now treating patients, can we use this as serial monitoring? Another medical student uh, here at Mount Sinai, Portal student, was in the lab for a year, uh, Hannah Monfried Major, and she's um, done this work. So we had about 480 patients. Uh, she, we use now the same two biomarker algorithm. Uh, we looked in the test cohort. Here's an a overall 27% mortality. And now we get huge separation uh, about, um, it's uh, both in the test uh, and the validation cohorts. And uh, we can even, in, in work that she's doing now, we can even see those who are, have responded to therapy within a week um, get broken out, and those who haven't responded to therapy in a week, have, have, you can break them out. So my, my colleague, John Levine, talks about this like, we finally have an instrument panel at the front of the airplane. Before, with clinical symptoms, we had to look out the window and, and, and see where we were. Now we've got at least an altimeter to, to say, it's not, it's not perfect, we don't have all of the, the, the measures that we want, but we have an instrument panel uh, from the laboratory to help us with this. So, in the, in the last part, I'm going to now tell you a little bit about biology. I think I have about 10 minutes left. So, it would be impossible, it's really impossible to, to do the mechanistic studies that we want to do in terms of what the meaning of this bio, the, these biomarkers is in, in clinical research. It's, it's just really not possible. So, now, we've, now we're going to go to animal models, and this is another part of my lab. It turns out <clears throat> that when we, this is still clinical data, when we look at, um, th this is from the University of Michigan, it was about 28 patients. If we looked at the, whether they expressed Reg3 by immunohistochemistry, uh, what their panic cell number was, and then what their blood count, what their blood concentration of Reg3 was. What we found was an, a surprising inverse relationship that we call it the Reg3 paradox, that if you have graft-versus-host disease, 
um, you wind up with less Reg3 in your biopsy uh, by um, immunohistochemistry. A many fewer PANA cells. I showed you some of those data. But in those same, those same patients, at the time that the biopsy is done, the Reg3 level is sky high in the blood. So what's going on? Because that's not what we expected at all. We expected somehow it to be more. So now we're going to go to the animal models. And what we can see, this is now a model of uh, graft-versus-host disease to minor histocompatibility antigens. It's like an unrelated donor model. It's a, the donors are brown mouse, the recipients are black mouse. They're completely different except that they have the same major histocompatibility complex. You can see uh, in black, these are the animals with GVHD and white uh, animals not. Uh, that, that over, these are days after transplant, their serum levels go up. But here's now the immunohistochemistry. You can see that the animals without graft-versus-host disease, all the brown staining, Reg3 is throughout the epithelium, and there's very little in the animals that have graft-versus-host disease. So this protein was described, the name, regenerative 3-alpha. There's something about a wound healing aspect, even though we know about its antimicrobial properties, which are real, there's something about a wound healing phenomenon that is important there, and the levels actually go up after, when you don't have graft-versus-host disease in the gut. If you do have graft-versus-host disease, they go down. That suggested that a, if you had no Reg3 to start with, you would have worse GVHD. There are Reg3 knockout animals. We did the experiments. Here you can see the wild types. Uh, and here are the knockouts. So you get significantly worse GVHD. They don't survive as well. If you look at the PANA cells, which is, is a very nice quantitative uh, measure of GI GVHD, you can see fewer PANA cells compared to the wild type. But it's not a PANA cell defect, because if you do uh, the transplant, you don't get graft versus host disease. Those PANA cells restored perfectly normally. So it's not a PANA cell problem. It's a don't know what kind of problem yet, but it's an antimicrobial peptide problem, or it's a Reg3 problem. It turns out, I told you about those ILC3 cells that induce Reg3. Well, it turns out those are also targets. In fact, they may, we hypothesize, that they're the primary targets of graft-versus-host disease. You lose those cells and you're losing a key modulator of innate lymphoid um, immunity in the gut. And so if you now give animals with graft-versus-host disease, IL-22, what happens? Is that the deficit? So here's, animal, this is at rest, and you can see the Reg3 here at the, in the base of the crypts. Uh, in graft-versus-host disease, you can see the blunting of the villi, even from this um, magnification, and there's less Reg3. And if you give IL-22, you get this exuberant expression of Reg3 throughout the villi, and you can see even here that the villus length is restored. You can, you can prevent graft-versus-host disease with IL-22. You can treat in these animals. You can treat it with IL-22. And now the question is, and, and here's the clinical data. So here's uh, saline, here's IL-22, and here's the clinical score for those animals. Is Reg3 required? That's the key question. So here's now some immunohistochemistry, um, uh, wild type GVH, just a little bit of Reg3, IL-22. I just showed you those data. You restore the villus lengths, and uh, you can see the Reg3 throughout. These are the knockout animals. Even worse, GVHD and no change. So Reg3 is required for the, the therapeutic aspects of IL-22. You can see this with the number of gamma interferon positive T cells that are, have infiltrated the lamina propria. You can see that in the wild types, um, the IL-22, which is in blue, uh, deep, so this is a measure of effector cells. You've decreased the number of effector cells, both in CD4s and CD8s, just one marker of, of GVHD in the GI tract. And as uh, we hope, so here are the wild types. These are two different models, so you've got wild types here being uh, rescued by IL-22. In the knockout animals, the GVHD is worse because Reg3 is absent, and IL-22 does nothing. And that's the same in a separate model. So what this suggests is, what, what we're so excited about this, 
And I hope you can tell we're excited about this. But what, the reason we're so excited about this is that every, all that Stone Age medicine that we've been talking about, that's trying to suppress the immune system, the effector immune system. Now we're starting to understand the innate immune system that's in, that controls some of the adaptive immune responses that are present in the GI tract, and which we had no clue about before. And now we have ways of enhancing that, maybe even enhancing that before the transplant. So uh, if you give IL-22 therapeutically and you induce Reg 3 you may be able to restore or even strengthen before the transplant this uh, physical chemical barrier that's in the GI tract that may help, at, which is the, the top of the cascade of GVHD that may be able to prevent some of the downstream effects. So this, this now kind of turns the entire field onto looking at the um, innate immune system, uh, the ways that the innate immune system interacts with the adaptive immune system, and uh, all of the studies that we're starting to do with Jeremiah Faith on the microbiome, um, uh, for example, antibiotics. We now know in experimental models that antibiotics make GVHD worse. And one of the reasons that it makes it worse in preliminary data is that it turns off IL-22 production. So you're actually diminished in, in terms of systemic antibiotics, which we need for our neutropenic patients, but we're now actually dramatically weakening their innate uh, uh, lymphoid defense systems that could be critical for GVHD later. So um, that's going to be, I think, a very rich area for both uh, experimental research and clinical research. Uh, and it, uh, as I say, I, I believe it's pointing us and it's just giving us a, a, a whole new dimension to look at other than suppressing the effector mechanisms. So to finish, we've used a large multicenter data set. We've developed a two biomarker signature at day seven that predicts non-relapse mortality and lethal GVHD. The algorithm can form the basis for preemptive GVHD treatment, so you're high risk on day seven. We could use, maybe use IL-22 to, you know, that it's not going to suppress the immune system. Uh, GVHD damages the innate lymphoid cells type 3, reducing IL-22 production, consequently Reg 3. IL-22 administration to treat GI GVHD requires uh, the induction of Reg 3. Let me thank the people who did the work, who are such fabulous collaborators, John Levine, I've mentioned several times, Matt Hartwell, uh, Hannah Major Monfried, Ernst Haller in um, Regensburg, uh, Umut Uzbek, who's our statistician, and Dong Cheng Zhao did the um, uh, animal experiments at the end. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, so the short answer is no. Um, we would love to. Um, it depends. It, I, I have to be honest. It took about it took about ten years to get a database and biorepository we were, where we could that was sufficiently um, complete to ask and answer a question like that. Even even when you had a lot of resources pouring into it, um, there there may be such biorepositories, and we'd be happy to look at it. What I can tell you is, and where I thought your question might have gone, um, is can you use these biomarkers for autoimmune GI diseases like inflammatory bowel disease? And the, and the answer is, you bet. So uh, John Fred Columbell and I are looking now at the, some of these Janssen um, biorepositories and databases. Uh, we're actually this month running about 350 samples from patients where they have very clearly annotated the, endosco uh, the endoscopy scores from patients with uh, all levels of IBD. And we're going to do the same sort of um, uh, training sets and test sets to see whether a similar, because you, uh, you know, in my simplistic way, um, uh, GVHD is an alloimmune disease and IBD is an autoimmune disease. There are some differences, but there are lots of similarities. 
Uh, and I think that that's going to be actually a very um, interesting avenue of research. And just from the solid organ perspective, these are very GI specific. Some of these are very GI specific. And it's right. So might that help rare. you in kidney? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty. It's mainly <coughs> that you get that you might see that effect, and it's pretty rare. So. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about uh, alpha-4 beta-7 as a target. I know mm -hmm. that there have been hints of its potential utility. I was wondering if there are any data about the impact of inhibiting alpha-4 beta-7 on graft versus leukemia. So, um, no. I, I, I would say in general um, that the ability to ask and answer questions about GVL is exceedingly difficult, be, in part because patients come, the baseline isn't steady. Patients come into transplant with, in remission, but th it can be hundreds of millions of, uh, any, anywhere from one to 10 to hundreds of millions of leukemic cells, and that is probably the single most important predictor of eventual relapse. So we'll probably, we'll try to ask that question, um, but I, I think the answer is going to be pretty hard. Well, there are uh, studies now starting, including our own study, which is, is, is actually um, using natalizumab, which is an alpha-4 beta-1 inhibitor, but the Ann Arbor 3 patients that were there, they're sending it, it's a trial that's here. The first patient in the world that was treated on a biomarker trial was here at Mount Sinai um, in September. But um, we will be asking that question. Or are they leaking out of the cells and therefore high in the serum and low in the cells? Right. So um, some of that is known. So the, these these data uh, about uh, within GVHD are not even yet published. So uh, that part has not yet been worked out. And all of the the um, basic biology has been looking at its antimicrobial peptide effect, and it's you know uh, fairly specific for gram positive cocci. But it almost certainly has immunomodulatory properties as well, and, and we're just starting that. Yeah. Um, in terms of Reg3, is there a distribution difference in the gut ileum versus other parts? Absolutely. So uh, it, it turns out that there's a sort of crescendo of Reg3 expression to the distal ileum. You then get some in the very proximal colon, and then and then a, a big decrescendo. Um, you can't, you can see a little bit of it in the duodenum, but it's, it's really in the terminal ileum where it's most heavily expressed. And that's, uh, of course, the area that we biopsy the least frequently. Um, and so that, and, and I think that's part of why that surprise had happened, because it's so, so dark and, and we can't tell what's happened. One last question. Is there any direct effect of the different conditioning regimens or immunosuppressants on the ILC3 cells? Oh, great question. Um, Probably. We know that ILC3s actually, uh, they persist beyond most conditionings. Um, and, uh, and they don't actually turn over. And that's why we think they're a target of graft-versus-host disease. And they're very slow to reconstitute. So that's, that's a very interesting uh, question as to whether you could modulate the conditioning to actually preserve ILC3 function. Um, and that's completely open at the moment. Only one paper I know that's looked at that. Listen, thank you so much. I know people have to, have to go, but if anybody has questions, I love questions, come on down and... and uh